again want to thank the Friends of the Library and the Tewksbury Cultural Council for sponsoring this morning's program. Uh, this morning we're here to learn how to identify and attract backyard birds. Have you always wanted to know what birds are visiting your yard or frequenting your bird feeder? Can't tell the difference between a purple finch and a house finch? Dr. Steve Hale will offer tips on identifying our resident and migrant feathered friends and let us know what to feed them to attract a diverse population. Audience members will also have the opportunity to test their own knowledge of birds. So Dr. Steve Hale is the owner and operator of Open World Explorers, which runs guided birding tours in New Hampshire. Steve is also a professor and researcher at the University of New Hampshire, where he earned his PhD in natural resources and he previously worked as a bird observer in the White Mountain National Forest. So uh, everyone, please give a big virtual round of applause to Steve for joining us here this morning. And uh, Dr. Hale, at this point, you can take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, and you know what, Dr. Hale, you're muted. There you go. Hey, thank you, Robert. Thanks for that great introduction and welcome everyone. Um, uh, I want to uh, thank Robert for the invitation to come uh, speak with you all this morning and, and of course, extend that um, thank you to the sponsors of the program. Um, this presentation uh, is one that focuses on our backyard birds. And I notice I have up here New Hampshire's backyard birds, but this goes to Maine also. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, Northern New England is what in southern New England, that's what this uh, all applies to. So you're going to um, have an opportunity to um, test your own knowledge on these uh, bird slides that, are, that I present to you. And we're gonna go over ID tips on how to identify them, okay? Um, a quick note before we get started, on the upper left here, you'll see my logo for Open World Explorers. This is a small business I created about four years ago to do outreach and education programs uh, for libraries and birding clubs and historical societies. So this is one presentation out of many uh, that I have. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see a list of those at the end too. So, okay. Um, let's proceed and dive right in because uh, I do encourage you to use the chat box for your questions. So I'm gonna move quickly, that way we get everything in, but I don't want anyone's questions to be left out. The presentation is broken into three main categories for birds uh, of our backyards. Not all birds are using our feeders. So this presentation is not just about the feeder birds, but it's the birds that also might take advantage of our landscaping to uh, breed and feed in our yards and things like that, but not necessarily coming to feeders. So these are birds that almost never use feeder. And as a biologist, you quickly learn um, when, when you're taking courses and training to never say never as a biologist because there will always be exceptions to the rules that come up. But for the most part, the birds we see in this section, um, they are almost never uh, seen on feeders. They may use the open spaces of our lawn and air for foraging, or they may use landscaping um, of our homes for nesting. Or dur and during migration season, which we are out of, we are no longer in migration season. In fact, we are ending the breeding season. Fourth of July actually starts or kicks off the beginning of fall migration. So breeding is actually wrapping up and birds, as we speak, are actually starting to head southward. Uh, for the winter already. It comes as a, as a surprise uh, that that's the case, but it is. Then we will be looking at um, other non-feeder birds. They don't necessarily get on the feeder, but they're attracted to the seed that might spill out and things like that. And then finally, the third section will, will focus on feeder birds and what to feed and how to diversify the birds that come to your yard, okay? Now I mentioned that this presentation is set up as a quiz. So I don't tell you what the bird is initially. I promise I will tell you, okay? And actually on the previous slide here, this kickoff slide, this is the warm up slide. So go ahead and enter in your chat box, uh, this one, if you feel like you know what this is. 
or if you just feel like taking a wild guess. What do you think this one is? Okay, so we got some results starting to come in. Yep, Tom Olson, American Robin, Robin, okay. Maria's got Robin, very good. This is our Robin, well, often, when I grew up in Pennsylvania, where um, my mom used to call this the Robin red breast. Of course, it has an orange breast. It's not really red, uh, but it's a very nice bird that we find bouncing on our lawns uh, when it returns in the spring and summer. So, very good. Now, how about this one? So I'm pretty sure some of these birds in this presentation are gonna be challenging. These aren't all birds that you're immediately familiar with. This one you may be familiar with, okay? It is slate gray overall with a black cap and a black tail, okay? So Maria's throwing out the question, is this a cat bird, okay? Tom says Northern Cardinal. Tom's using the, uh, or, or maybe he means northern catbird. Tom's using these four-letter abbreviations that bird banders often use. Uh, but NOCA would be the abbreviation for northern cardinal. This is, in fact, the gray catbird. Very good. So gray catbird, one of the features we don't often see are these red underpants. Okay, so some of you, if you have um, some binoculars that you might keep by the window, after this presentation, you'll be able to look for some of these field marks. But gray catbirds do not typically come to feeders, but they are notorious for nesting in the shrubs right up to our house, our homes. You can often look out a bedroom window down into a rhododendron or an azalea and often find a gray catbird nest in there, okay? Gray catbirds are notorious and get their name for a vocalization they make that sounds like a, the mew of a cat. They go, mew, mew, okay? They're also in the mockingbird family or the family that contains the mockingbird called the mimics. And we're all probably familiar that mockingbirds um, are able to imitate other uh, bird species and that is correct. And the gray catbird, not so much. But later in the presentation, we're gonna see mockingbird and I'm gonna teach you how to identify the mockingbird and the catbird and another bird, the brown thrasher, by their sound, okay? There's a couple sound and vocalizations in the presentation we'll get to work on as well. But this is the gray catbird, very common around our homes. I'll give you another hint if you wanna see these birds. Ornithologists and bird watchers often do this um, um, uh, thing called pishing, where we go, psh, 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 psh. you do it nice and loud in a bush where you think there's a bird. Pishing often will invoke a great cat bird to come out and look at you. And then when you do that, you put your binoculars on him and look right back. So it's, it's very good. Here's another bird that is frequently around our homes, okay? Doesn't use our feeders. In fact, this bird's an insect eater. He's got a nice morsel right here. Very brown overall. Lots of barring on the tail. See how tight and how many bars there are on this pretty long tail, okay? This bird is a little bit bigger than a tufted titmouse, bigger than a chickadee. Um, but not significantly so, okay? But kind of drab brown overall. You will frequently find these birds nesting in the houses, bird houses that Cub Scouts make um, and we hang them from our trees. They're usually, the holes are a little bit smaller than um, say a bluebird box house, okay? So Marianne's guessing flycatcher, that's a good guess. Okay, not quite correct, okay. And Tom is, Tom is honing in on it, okay. This little brown nondescript bird is the house wren, okay. Very commonly nesting in the houses, bird houses we have around our homes. And they do often, um, they'll put sticks into many homes. If you have, say, four bird houses around your yard, 
you might find sticks shoved into all of them, but only one of them might actually have the nest. And what they do is the males will shove the, the houses or the cavities with sticks and then the females will go around and inspect and decide which one she, she wants to uh, make as their nest. I remember growing up as a kid in Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, and my mom would tell me to go out and clear the paper tube from all the sticks from the house wren because it would be filled up and then the, the newspaper delivery person could not uh, get the newspaper in there. It's kind of a fun chore. Okay, look at this beautiful fellow. Okay, when you get, when we have these around our yards and we get a good binocular view on these, they are strikingly handsome. This photo, this is actually a photo, but it looks almost like a painting, a pastel painting. And uh, Brianna, uh, yeah, Brianna has uh, um, a good guess there and June has a good guess. We're honing in that this is a cedar wax wing. Okay, they get their name because of these little rack, uh, waxy looking tips. They're waxy looking, they're not really wax, but they come off of the end of the feather shafts on these uh, uh, feathers here. But what is really diagnostic for cedar waxwing is this yellow tail band at the end. It looks as if the bird had perched on a bucket of yellow paint and got its tail dipped in there and then flew away. And now it is marked forever. Uh, its tail looks kind of like a paintbrush. And when they're flying by, you can see this feature. So look for this around your homes. These birds are very gregarious, meaning they tend to um, occur in flocks, big numbers, anywhere at flocks of maybe five to 20. And you'll see them flying across the sky sometimes and you'll be able to immediately tell a, uh, a, a flock of these uh, birds because they're, one of, they're the smallest bird we have that flies in these close flocks on a regular basis, okay? Um, Brian LeMay indicates he had a flock of them playing in his sprinkler the other day. That's very cool. Um, I guess maybe taking a bird bath uh, in his sprinkler. So birds do often, uh, to do those types of behaviors. In the winter time, we do sometimes in our yards, even in Massachusetts, although more so in New Hampshire, but they do come down to Massachusetts in some extreme winters. Um, we have another species called the Bohemian waxwing, which looks very similar, but will have more reddish tones here underneath the tail, where the cedar waxwing is white. This will be more of a maroon color and this masky area around the face will be more of a maroon color than the bohemian waxwing. And it's always a treat in years when we get large numbers of bohemian waxwings. Okay. Um, so someone in, um, Fiona says in Scotland they have waxwings. Um, I don't think they're the same thing, Fiona. That's a good question. Fiona asks, would they be the same as our wax wings. And Fiona, I'm gonna actually have to look that up. I do have a book called The Birds of, uh, the Birds of Britain in Europe, and I'm pretty familiar with it. And I don't recall that there are wax wings in Europe. Maybe somebody else can uh, provide that information, but I certainly can look that up and get back to you. And um, I would, probably route that answer through Robert and then you could contact Robert uh, for the answer, but I'm pretty sure I can answer that question. Okay. How about this handsome fellow? Okay. We have these guys. This is the most common owl that we have in our yards and around our yards. Can anybody take any guesses on what this is? Brianna says it's the barred owl, so does Brian, okay. Mar Maria also. So it looks like we're building a consensus this is the barred owl, and that is correct. This is the barred owl. I often get answers in other presentations I've given on this that it's the snowy owl, and because it's so white looking or light colored in front, 
This is not a snowy owl. A snowy owl would be strikingly white. It would be as white as this panel over here to the right um, is white. This is the barred owl. I'm going to play the song for the barred owl, and uh, I hope that it will come over across uh, so that you'll be able to hear it. And then you can tell me if you think you've heard this before. So in the chat box, you can just say yes, or I've heard that or something. Do those vocalizations sound familiar? As Tom writes, who cooks for you? That's a mnemonic device we use to help us remember that this is the barred owl. The barred owl says, who cooks for you? Ooh, 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 ooh. Now in that sequence of vocalizations, um, it got a little weird in there. They don't often sound like that, but the typical who cooks for you sound call is also in there. But I do include that to um, remind everyone there's a lot of variation in bird songs, just like our voices have a lot of variation and we can distinguish our voices. There's a lot of variation in bird song as well. Okay. But this is the barred owl, the most common owl around our yards. Okay. Now we're still working on birds that do not typically come to feeders or almost never come to feeders. This one actually does come to suet feeders with some frequency, not very often but it does, okay? And Brian is, has put his guess up, if anybody else wants to make guesses. Brian says this is a northern flicker, okay? And Brian is right, Tom is right, this is a northern flicker. And I wanna ask the next question, what kind or family of bird would you say the northern flicker belongs to? Okay. Brian indicates it's a woodpecker. Anybody else? Tom, woodpecker. Yep. Maria, woodpecker. Yeah, this is a woodpecker, okay? It doesn't have woodpecker in its name, but that doesn't stop it from being a woodpecker. Uh, this is the northern flicker, and even more specifically, we'll call this the yellow shafted flicker. It has relatives out west that are the red shafted flicker, and it gets its name for these yellow feather shafts you can see here on these primary feathers. And there's yellow here on the trailing webs of, uh, of the feathers that give them this name, yellow shafted flicker. Now, as a yard bird, and not all of us have the same conditions for yard. So when we talk about yards, some of us have more urban yards or suburban yards, and some people with very rural yards might have hay fields and pasture uh, or several acres of, of, of yard. One thing to note, has anyone seen these birds feeding in your yard? Go ahead and put in the chat box if you've seen these. Yep, I see uh, uh, Siligini or Ganey uh, has indicated that she has them. Okay, Brian not here. Um, Brianna once, okay. So uh, rarely, yeah. So actually, if these guys are not feeding in your yard, you might actually view this as a good thing. The flickers are the woodpecker that is most likely to be found on the ground, okay? Woodpeckers typically are in trees and we see them bouncing up the side of the tree, um, searching the bark crevices for insects. Flickers will do that also but they will also feed in the yard, probing in through the soil. Mary Ann says she has a lot. And this brings me to my, to my uh, conclusion on this. Flickers are a good indicator if, you, if a yard has grubs, okay? So Mary Ann, if you have lots of them feeding in your yard, you might have grubs because they're attracted to it. And that means you, you have a big flicker feeder and I am, I, for one, um, think that's a good thing. The flickers are positive about 
uh, finding yards with grubs, and they're fantastic to watch. Not everyone is fond of having grubs in their yard. It does uh, hurt the grass and things like that, but uh, it makes the flickers happy. Okay, this guy's kind of nondescript, generally brown. They run from brown to gray-brown. They can be more gray also, okay? Notice this bird is, uh, it's got a nest and it's under the eave of this house. This is a house. This uh, thing it's building on, this might be a dryer vent or something like that, or maybe a kitchen vent. Yeah, so we're, the um, answers are coming in. We see it's feeding a grasshopper to these babies. This is a typical nest that they build. And they almost always build them um, under the eaves of our houses or in a shed or under a deck. They like to have something overhanging above them to keep the, uh, the weather off of the nest. This is the Eastern Phoebe, okay? He says, Phoebe, Phoebe, when you watch them perched in a tree or a wire, they'll often pump their tail. That's a characteristic for this bird. It's in the flycatcher family. So this is a, a bird that is mostly an insectivore, okay? The flycatchers um, in our bird books, one of the things about them is they eat insects. They very often, they perch on a branch and they fly out, catch an insect, and then they fly back to the same branch or close to the same branch. One of the differences with Phoebe, and a story I like to tell is that Phoebes are actually a better harbinger of spring than the American robin. We often think of the robin as the sign of spring when robins show, back, show up back in our yards. But robins are actually around us all winter. There are, there are many robins that don't migrate at all. And on our Christmas bird counts, we count hundreds of robins in the dead of winter. I even go snowshoeing up in the White Mountains and I'll find many robins, flocks of robins. The Phoebe though is the bird that I use as my sign of spring. When it returns, it really means spring is coming. They arrive, they're the first flycatcher to arrive and they come late March, early April. And sometimes you guys know that we can still get pretty significant snowstorms then. But what allows the Phoebe to survive those storms is it can um, be flexible in its food and it also eats a lot of fruit. So it can go into wetlands and pull off fruit that has remained from over the uh, previous winter. Okay, but these guys are very notorious for nesting around our homes. Go ahead and put in your chat box if you've got any Phoebes nesting on or around your home. I'm gonna bet some of you out there do. Okay, Brian asks, what distinguishes this from a thrush? So um, thrushes are gent typically, you would say, when you look at them, are plumper or fatter, okay? And the Phoebe has these flycatcher habits of sitting on a perch and flying out and catching insects and flying back. Thrushes do not feed that way. Thrushes will feed by largely being on the ground and picking up leaves and cat and finding things underneath of leaves, things like that, okay? They'll also pull things off of the bark, uh, off of twigs and, and off of leaves, but the Phoebes are catching insects out of the air, okay? Brianna has them here and in Maine, nesting around her home. This is a beautiful photo against a bright blue sky. Okay, let's see some guesses for what people think this bird might be. Kite, red-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk. Okay, mostly red-tailed hawk. So Fiona, you're, um, uh, uh, maybe you're um, thinking of, uh, European birds again. Um, so it's not a kite. So this is a red-tailed hawk. There are more, there are, uh, kites are prolific in um, 
across the Atlantic. We do have a few kite, kite species in North America, but most of them are to the south. There are a few Mississippi kites um, actually breeding in New Hampshire, uh, but most kites are southern species. This is in fact the red-tailed hawk, and it gets its name for this tail, and the tail is not red, it's more orangish in color. And when you see the bird flying overhead, if you see this, you can easily identify it by the tail color. Sometimes, however, the color in the sun is not quite right for that. So we need to use this feature that runs across the belly. We call this a belly band, okay? It's a splash of, um, of dark streaks across the belly. So the red-tailed hawk has a clean white chest and clean white below the belly, and this belly band separates that white into a top and bottom half. Very often when you're driving down the highway, you'll see these birds perched on the side of the road, and it's our biggest hawk that we have, and it's also the most common. It's one most likely to be found um, in our suburbs and rural settings. So uh, that's why it's included here, but of course it's not likely to land on a feeder. But this is a red-tailed hawk, one of our most common um, uh, large hawks that uh, lives with us and around our yards. Okay, now I have a little story to tell you about the red-tailed hawk. Some of you might remember back in um, the 90s, there was a show on TV called Northern Exposure. Go ahead and nod your head or type in the chat box if you remember uh, Northern Exposure. So when Northern Exposure would come on Sunday evening, it would be right after 60 Minutes, and 60 Minutes would be ending, and it goes tick, 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 and the screen goes black, and then the next thing you see is this soaring bald eagle flying through the sky, a sky blue like this. And when you, hear, when you see the bald eagle soaring, you'd hear this cry. Can you hear that? striking fear into all the small mammals below. The problem is that's not the sound of the red-tailed, I mean, that's the sound of the red-tailed hawk, not the bald eagle. This is what the bald eagle sounds like. It sounds like a kind of a wimpy little mouse type thing. So what the Hollywood producers do is they take the majestic view of the bald eagle, but they take our backyard bird, the red-tailed hawk vocalization, and put it over the bald eagle to make the bald eagle sound scary and frightening. So it's Hollywood playing tricks on us. Okay, as promised I, um, earlier, I want to bring you back to this bird. This is, I'm going to tell you what this one is, although you can go ahead and, and um, type it into the chat. This is the one that was close, it's closely related to the gray cat bird that we saw earlier. And this bird, a lot of people will um, complain about it because it wakes them up very early in the morning in the summer, starts singing around 4.30 or 5 a.m. Okay, remember this, this is the northern mockingbird. Okay, so they do sing very early. They're fantastic mimics of other bird songs, but I'm going to tell you how to tell a northern mockingbird from the other eastern members of the mimic family, and those are the brown thrasher and the gray catbird. Okay, the northern mockingbird sings its song in threes. It's going to repeat notes in threes. It doesn't matter what the notes are, but it repeats them in threes. I'm going to demonstrate for you. Okay. Don't pay attention to what I'm saying, but pay attention to the pattern that I'm saying it. D, 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 whoop, 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 beep, 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 Okay, so everything was repeated in at least threes for the Northern Mockingbird. The Brown Thrasher, which looks very similar to this, except it's gonna be brown with some streaks. It repeats everything in twos. Doo-doo, wah-wah, beep, beep, zee, zee, nah, nah, come back, 
Cabret, okay? Brown Thrasher. And then the third one, which we saw earlier, which was the gray catbird, you're familiar with the mu call note, but when he sings, he does not repeat his notes at all. They're all over the place. I can't imitate him because that's too hard. But he sounds like R2-D2. So if you, if you hear a bird that sounds like R2-D2 singing from a yard or shrub near your tree, there's a good chance it's a gray cat bird. Then you can pish it. There's a good chance it'll pop up and look at you, and then you'll be able to look back at it. But the northern mockingbird is the one that sings in threes. So you'll have to test that if you have some uh, mockingbirds around. Quick note, in August, breeding is essentially finished for almost all birds. There's very little bird song happening in August. The woods will go essentially quiet. It'll be hard to find birds at that point. They're still gonna be there. They're feeding to get ready for the migration, but they, uh, um, they're, they're largely quiet, okay? So, this bird nests on um, structures around our home too. Also, if you have a shed, uh, anywhere they can get up under, similar to the Phoebe, they'll make a, a cup mud nest. Notice the very long wings. The wings on this bird are about the same length as the body from head to, to, uh, to the kind of butt area here. If th and this is the end of the wings. This is the end of the tail, and you can see one, two little tail features here, and we call those tail streamers. And when this bird is flying, they're going to be separated and form what we call a swallow tail. You might be familiar with that term, swallow tail. This is a swallow, and this is, in fact, the barn swallow. Okay, very common nester around our homes. The barn swallow population is declining in New England. So if you have barn swallows around your fields or in your yard, feel fortunate. And uh, if you have a shed or structure you feel like taking down, you might wanna rethink it if barn swallows are using it because uh, what looks like an old dilapidated structure to us is a piece of prized real estate for barn swallows. And they're very beneficial to have around because they're eating mosquitoes and flies and things, catching them out of the air. So they're a good form of natural uh, insecticide. One of my favorite birds around our yards are the colorful warblers. There's about 17 or more species of warblers that either uh, migrate through or uh, breed around our homes. Most of them migrate through up to thick forest areas, but some of them actually are around our homes and gardens. And this is one of them. Um, I'm gonna, I need to pull my chat box back up here so I can see what people, uh, okay. So if, if anybody has any guesses on this warbler, go ahead and go out on a limb and say what you think this warbler might be. And I'm gonna teach you how to identify its song. This is the yellow warbler, okay? The name is appropriate. Many warblers have yellow in them, but up here in the Northeast, it's the only one that has yellow everywhere, even on the feathers. Even if the feathers are, are mostly black, they still have some yellow. The other warblers have uh, yellow partitioned into different places, either the top of the head or maybe just on the chest, something like that. But this bird is yellow everywhere. Very common around our homes, especially if you live in suburbs um, or if you're, a, if you're in a green space in an urban setting, you can find them. Listen, if I'm gonna play the song now. Listen for this phrase. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Now he's not gonna say those words, but you're gonna listen for the pattern. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. 
Can go ahead and um, indicate in your chat box if you can hear it or if you cannot. You feel free to say I don't hear it, Steve. I think you're crazy. That's also an acceptable response. Uh, let me know. Yes. So Brian says he hears it. Tom says he hears it. Uh, Fiona hears it. Mar Maria, good. Lots of people are hearing it. This is the only bird in North America that utters this phrase in this way. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. So when you go out and you hear this, you can be sure that you've got a yellow warbler. Now, yellow warblers can also sing other songs, but they do so less. This is its primary song. It's the one you hear most often, and it's very reliable indicator for yellow warbler. So before uh, July runs out, I'm gonna encourage you all to do a walk around your neighborhood best time of day would be in the morning and uh, see if you can hear some yellow warblers in your in your neighborhood. I, I'm going to bet that some of you will. Okay, now we're going to look at uh, birds that don't regularly use feeders, but they may sometimes or they may be attracted to the seed that spills out. Okay, sometimes these are birds that are just too big. Okay, go ahead and type in. I'm gonna bet many of you know this one. So, and Tom asked a question about the previous yellow warbler. Is it just the male singing? And Tom, I do believe that it is only the males that yellow warblers that sing. There are some species of birds where the females do also sing. An example of that is the purple finch those females sing, but in most cases, males sing and um, the females do not. Okay, so we do have a number of responses coming in and Audrey says she's got lots on the ground under her feeders. This is the morning dove, okay, morning dove. Diana, I want, I want you to note the spelling of morning because here we are talking about it's the dove of sadness. So it's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And it gets its name because of its sad wailing call, which I didn't play here, but it's a coo sound. And you've probably heard it. It is sometimes mistaken for a great horned owl call or vice versa. Sometimes the great horned owl call is mistaken as a morning dove because they can sound similar at times. But morning doves do come to our feeders but they're pretty big and some bird feeders just aren't built to be able to hold them. And therefore morning doves are often found feeding on the ground. Okay, if you've got this bird on your feeder, it's time for a new feeder because it's probably broken and shattered on the ground. Okay, what do we have here? Nancy has these every morning. Turkey, yeah, the wild turkey. Orn the ornithological name or common name for this bird is the wild turkey, not just turkey. In South America, there is another turkey called the oscillated turkey. So uh, there's a little bit of a distinction. But if you say turkey in North America, everybody will know uh, what bird you're referring to. Butterball, Fiona says butterball. That's right, okay. A big round butterball. They're fun to watch when the males are all puffed out. Now, this bird, how many people have these in their yards? A few of you? This bird, so I put this in the category of sometimes comes to feeders. More and more often now, these birds regularly come to feeders because of the popularity of, of having mealworms at feeders. You can buy dried mealworms, or if you go to like a wild, uh, wild bird supply store, they have live mealworms that they feed. And you can put them out for bird, and then you will attract these guys. And you can even attract things like warblers 
and uh, species that we would not traditionally have coming to feeders because they'll eat the mealworms. But this is the Eastern Bluebird, the Bluebird of Happiness. Tom has them also feeding on jelly. It's amazing, one of the things that's happened is um, it's been very common for people to put jelly out for Orioles, and now we're finding that many, many birds will come to the uh, sugary sweetness from jelly, uh, birds we would not have expected otherwise. And bluebird is one of those, catbird loves jelly. All of the blackbirds, red-winged blackbird, grackles, they enjoy jelly a great deal also. But this is the eastern bluebird. We've got the male on the left who is very brightly colored blue. And then the more drab colored female, more cryptically colored, uh, Eastern Bluebird. And these birds, uh, if you want to attract these birds to your home, it's good if you have significant open area. If you have a very small yard and all of the homes around you are very small yard, it's probably not open enough. Um, but the fewer the trees, the better. So they'd like fields, but they do like some trees scattered around to land in. And they also like fence posts. So uh, very often, if you have any pastures around, uh, they'll, they'll be attracted to those. Uh, Tom is pointing out, what are the blossoms in this image? And I'll be honest with you, Tom, I do not know. But I'd be welcome to have your guess. Uh, yeah. OK, now I had two birds for this next slide. Okay, I'm going to play the song for this one. I'm going to guess you all know this, or at least you know what this one is. You might be a little less certain about this, but let's start with this one on the left. Tell me what you think this is. That sound familiar? If you have some wetlands near you, you'll hear that song. Conqueree. That's right, this is the red-winged blackbird, okay? And Audrey's already way ahead of me, okay? What do you think this giant thing is? I shouldn't call it a giant. It's about the same size as that. Uh, looks like a heavily streaked sparrow, but it's not. This is actually the female red-winged blackbird. So these are both blackbirds. And uh, this is what we call sexual dimorphism. When the males and females appear differently so you can tell the males and females apart. The eastern bluebird we saw previously, those are sexually dimorphic. Turkeys are sexually dimorphic. But not all birds are sexually dimorphic. The mockingbird is not. The gray catbird that we saw is not. The house wren is not. So some birds are sexually dimorphic and some are not. Now we're gonna go into our final section and we're gonna talk about feeder birds. So all of these birds regularly use bird feeders and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the type of food uh, that they eat and how you can increase diversity in your yard. Okay, I start out with a good one in this section, don't I? How many people have these guys in their yards? It's a lot of fun to feed them. There's a lot of different varieties of feeders for the ruby-throated hummingbird, okay? In North America, there are probably about 12 to 15 species of hummingbirds, but there is only one that is regularly um, living east of the Mississippi River, and that's this one, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So when you get out your book and you're trying to identify what hummingbird you have, typically you don't have to look too hard. If you look at the range map in your book, it'll quickly show that ruby-throated hummingbird is the only one that is regularly here. When you're feeding these birds, you do not need to use red dye when you make your sugar solution. And your sugar solution should be four parts water for every part sugar. So if you're using cups, four cups of water, put in one cup of sugar, 
dissolve it good and put it out. Do not put in the red dye, it's completely unnecessary. These birds are attracted to the red and yellow features of the feeder themselves. And even, um, they'll come inspect um, even a glass uh, for sugar water also. It doesn't have any red in it at all. They're very territorial. Brianna indicates they're mean when the feeder is empty. And I, uh, I'll, I'll break it to you, Brianna. They're mean even when the feeder is full. They will continue to guard and chase that, um, chase other rivals away. Uh, that is a prized resource for them. Do hummingbirds eat things other than sugar water and nectar that sugar water we put out for them and nectar that they get from flowers naturally? Do they eat other things? What are some thoughts on other things that they eat? Or maybe they just eat sugar water. I think we all kind of know they probably don't just eat sugar water. They cannot just exist on water and carbohydrates. And Marianne is indicated and Tom is indicated, yeah, they eat bugs. When they put their bill in that flower, we don't really see what's happening. But if you go inspect the flower, if you open it up, you're going to find more in there than just a, a nectar solution. There's other bugs that are attracted to that flower. And those flowers are loaded with bugs. And hummingbirds are actually feeding on those. They also feed on spiders because they can hover and pick the spiders right out of the webs. They can also pick the prey that the spider captures with its web, essentially stealing it from the spider. Because remember, these birds are raising young. They have their babies in their nest. They need protein to build new babies, new tissues, bones and feathers and muscle. So they have to deliver more than just sugar water. They're actually out there capturing lots and lots of insects. Okay, if you feed birds, you might have had both of these species on your feeders. And this is a very challenging species. I'm gonna try to help you determine how to identify these. First of all, the two, we need to know what species we're talking about. These are both different, but they're very similar. One of them is the house finch, and the other one is the purple finch. There can be a challenge to identify if you haven't had practice and experience. And I'm gonna go through a little bit on how to identify them. If you want to in your chat box, you can write, like top house finch, bottom purple finch, or something like that, if you'd like to register a guess. Otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you how to tell them apart. First, I'm going to show you what to look for. In the males, so we have a male here with the red in each panel, and then the females are the more drab brown birds. If you look in this on this slide, can you see that there is red or purplish color in these feathers? You might have to get close to your computer screen, but the red that is on the head and on the chin is actually infused also down here in the wings on this bird. If you look on the bird on the bottom, it is not. In fact, the red is very restricted to the chest, throat, and head on this guy but the back has none to very little red and the wings have no red in them at all. So the red is much more restricted, okay? We actually, so we have the purple finch on top and the house finch on the bottom. Purple finch has red infused in with these browns and the house finch, male house finch does not. You can distinguish these two based on color the color of the red. This is more of a purplish or wine colored red, but color can be tricky or difficult depending on the light conditions you're viewing it under. So it can be best to try and see how the color is distributed uh, in the males. The females are a lot easier. Females are a lot easier. Note the female uh, house finches on the bottom. The browns are thin 
thin little streaks and they're numerous. On the female purple finch, the browns are thick and there aren't as many of them. And also the brown is dark brown and the white against it is very white. So there's a lot more contrast between the browns and whites in the female purple finch than there is in the female house finch, okay? The final thing I'll mention is this eye line. There's a very bold eye line in the female purple finch that the female house finches lack. So these gals, the, the female house finches, they look just kind of like a, a drab overall brown, creamy chested with some very fine brown streaks. But these guys look, females look very boldly colored. They look similar to a female rose-breasted grosbeak if you've had a chance to see one of those, only much smaller. Okay, so hopefully you can see that in the purple finch and the house finch. In our settings, in settings like Tewksbury and most um, um, residential settings, house finches outnumber the purple finches by a great deal. You really need to go into significant stands of forest and they actually breed up in the high elevations of the White Mountains and the conifer forests there. Okay. There are three different species on these two pictures, and they're all very closely related. They're all in the same genus. You remember from high school biology, you might have learned kingdom phylum class, order, family, genus, species, that all birds are assigned to those. And then the last two, genus and species, is what constitutes their scientific name. But all three of these are in the same genus, indicating they're closely related. I'm going to ask you to type in what you think this brightly yellow colored one is with the black cap. Okay, this one doesn't have a black cap. This is a female. Okay, and the results are coming in strong and nicely that that is the American goldfinch. That's good. Let's see if I do that. American goldfinch. How about this one? This does not look like the others. Any guesses on this? Brian says Siskin. Note there's a little flash of yellow here. It's a little hard to see, it's subtle, but this bird is heavily streaked, has a very sharp uh, pointy bill, very strong at the base. This is the pine Siskin. Oops, and I gave away the wrong one. That's the common uh, red pole. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. So we got pine siskin and then common red pole. The siskin and red pole come to our feeders in the winter times in some years when food is not very abundant up in the Can Canada region. We'll have large flocks of red poles and siskins come down to our feeders. And this is the type of seed they like. They like this, it's called black Niger. It can be spelled N I G E R or N-Y-J-E-R. It's also called thistle or black thistle. It's the Cadillac of bird seed. It's very expensive, but these birds love it. You put them in these feeders with these little tiny holes so things like house sparrows and squirrels can't get at it. And that reserves it for, for these guys. So I recommend any feeding in the winter, you have at least some kind of uh, feeder uh, these tube feeders are great, but this bag feeder works fine too. Um, but definitely you should have some uh, black Niger seed out. And usually once every five or six years, we'll get good numbers of pine siskin and common red pole to uh, brighten up your winter yard. Anybody recognize this one? If you're a Red Sox fan, or a baseball fan, you'll recognize this as the uh, mascot for the Toronto baseball team. That's right, this is the Blue Jay. They like these tray feeders. Blue Jay is a big bodied bird and fitting on those houses, those house type structures is difficult for them. 
So if you actually want to try to exclude or minimize blue jays on your feeders, then um, use those houses. But if you want to increase your diversity and say, uh, uh, and feed everything, use the, these tray feeders either hanging or sitting on a post. And then you can get things like morning doves and cardinals and blue jays all coming to those. Cardinals are a little smaller than blue jay and they can, they can um, also land on the house type feeders. Okay, now we have one more um, identification challenge. Similar to the purple and house finch, there are two woodpeckers that come to our feeding stations that look nearly identical. So you're probably familiar with these and you know that the, you may know that the choices are hairy woodpecker or downy woodpecker. So go ahead and put your guess uh, hairy on the left or hairy on the right. One thing you should know is that I stretched the downy woodpecker image so that it's the same size as the hairy. Natural, in, um, in real life, the downy woodpecker is significantly smaller than the hairy woodpecker. But I did not want you to use that as a clue in your identification because sometimes we don't, we don't have the ability to judge size correctly depending on what our reference is and context. So these birds are stretched to approximately the same size. So I'm getting um, a mix of results. We've got hairy on the left. Some people are saying hairy on the right. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you uh, how to identify the hairy and downy. So when they go on your uh, suet feeder, uh, you can uh, practice. Okay, first, here's the big reveal. Here's the answer. It is hairy on the left and downy on the right. So what you would do when you're looking at these birds through your binoculars, in, a, in an imaginary way, you're gonna chop the bill off of the face of this hairy woodpecker at the base, and you're gonna slide it back so that the tip is now at the base. And if the tip is at the base, then the base would be back here well past the eye, okay? If you slide it back, the base goes well past the eye. If you do the same exercise in a downy woodpecker, the base of the bill comes to just near the back of the eye. So this is a way of saying the hairy woodpecker is proportionally longer billed than the downy woodpecker. And this is very noticeable with your uh, binoculars. And, and over time with practice, you'll even be able to notice this with your eyes. I'm gonna give you another characteristic to look for because sometimes you might think, oh, it, it looks like it's past the eye and I'm not sure because you need to build up practice with that too. But if you look at these white outer tail feathers in the hairy woodpecker, they're clean. There's no markings on them. The downy woodpecker has little black bars on its outer white tail feathers. There are a few, very few downy woodpeckers that are clean white tail, but very few. This is actually a pretty reliable field mark. And when we are doing bird ID, you know, we're using a collection of field marks to uh, reach our, our uh, diagnosis. Okay, so that's the hairy woodpecker and downy woodpecker challenge. So hopefully that gave you guys some tips on how to separate those uh, in the field and at your homes. How about this one? Pretty uh, familiar chickadee. So this is the black cap chickadee to be more specific. Um, if you go down to Pennsylvania and further south, there's another chickadee species there called the Carolina chickadee. They look very, very similar, very similar. But ours here in New England, um, around our homes is the black cap chickadee. If you go up to the White Mountains, up in the spruce fir forest there, there's yet another species of chickadee called the boreal chickadee. Okay, you'll find this bird walking up and down the trees. It can walk head first down the tree or head first up the tree. The white-breasted nuthatch. 
-hmm. has a close relative, the red-breasted nuthatch, which we also can have in our area, okay, white-breasted. Here's some eye candy for you to brighten your day. Hopefully you get to see one of these sometime. If you live near a power line corridor or a golf course, a place where there's a lot of mix of different heights of trees, you might find this. This is the indigo bunting. They do come to our feeders as well. Does anybody have indigo bunting coming to feeders? Go ahead and put that in the chat box if you do. I'd be interested to know the answer to that because they do come to feeders and that's a lot of fun. I do not have any coming to my feeders. I wish I did. Brian asked, what do the buntings eat? They eat the same kind of regular bird seed that the chickadees and nuthatches eat. They'll eat black oil, sunflower, or they'll even eat uh, the mixed, um, mixed types of seeds. Nothing special for, uh, for the um, indigo bunting. Uh, Northern Cardinal, okay. And I talked about uh, the, the sunflower seed. Black oil sunflower seed is a preferred seed over the striped sunflower seed. The striped seed is cheaper and the birds seem to know it. They prefer the black, cat, uh, the black oil because they have uh, rich tastes, I guess. Whoops, I just hit some wrong buttons. This is the last slide in our little uh, survey through, um, oh, I put the name there, sorry, uh, through our survey of the birds. This is the bird that's most likely to be found bouncing on your lawn. If you have a manicured, grassy cut lawn, it's, the, it's a sparrow. So robins would be the most common one bouncing on your lawn. But if you've got a little brown job, it's tiny, and it spends a lot of time eating and feeding in the grass. Get your binoculars and look for this beautiful, rusty, chestnut-colored cap. They've got a beautiful, uh, sleek-looking black eye line with white eye stripe above, big white patch. When we identify sparrows, and there's a lot of different sparrows to identify out there, one of the first questions we asked is, is it streaked or is it unstreaked? and chipping sparrows are unstreaked. The other common backyard bird we have that is streaked is the song sparrow. But this is the chipping sparrow, okay? The one most likely to be found feeding in your yard. So I'm gonna bet some of you have chipping sparrows in your yards. I do, I have about three of them, three or four that regularly come to my yards. When they sing, they do a, a steady trill without really any variations to it, okay? So that concludes our survey through some of the bird feeding and other birds that come to your backyards. I do have other presentation titles. Um, Robert mentioned that he has a survey um, that he would like you all to complete. And so I wanna um, put another plug in for that do fill out that survey. And if you enjoyed this presentation, do let Robert know. And if there's a presentation that I could offer in the future, I would be happy to do so. And uh, with that, I'll take uh, any other questions, any questions you all might have. Quick note down here, in addition to doing these presentations, I do guided bird trips and bird walks for people who wanna um, improve their uh, bird ID. I can do these in the form of classes or just let's go out and find as many things as we can. And uh, I do a lot of trips on Plum Island in Massachusetts and up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So with that, I'll take any questions. And I guess, Robert, if you want people to be able to unmute, that will be fine. Yep, uh, so I'm gonna stop recording.